When someone asks you what you do, how do you describe your business? The natural, the natural reaction may be to call your business auto repair. But let's be honest, you're really in the credit, customer satisfaction, and counseling business. I'm Doug Kaufman with Shop Owner Magazine. Welcome to SOS Shop Owner Solutions. We're exploring some of the nightmares that shop owners face, those 3 a.m. panics, the things that either keep you up at night or don't let you fall asleep in the first place. And truly, shop operations have changed. Are you keeping up? This episode is brought to you by 360 Payments, the automotive industry's leading credit card processor. 360 Payments make payments simple, secure, and streamlined for auto shops through seamless integration with dozens of shop management software and DVI tools. 360 Payments offer solutions for in-person and remote payments, including text-to-pay, which lets your customer pay from their smartphone when it's convenient for them. Visit 360payments.com slash podcast to learn more. My partner here in the studio with me is Vic Tarasik from Shop Owner Coach. Vic, it's good to be with you. It's good to be here with you, Doug. On today's episode, we're interviewing Steve Sibitoni, CEO and co-founder of 360 Payments. We'll talk about how he and his partners built a successful payment technology company from scratch. 360 Payments began in a spare bedroom in an apartment of San Jose, California, and the company now services more than 7,000 businesses in the U.S. and Canada and processes more than $5 billion a year in payments. Steve, welcome to Shop Owner Solutions. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thanks so much, Vic and Doug, for having me on the show today. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, a little bit about myself. I have uh, grew up in Philadelphia and I was uh, you know, born in a family of a small business owner. So I, t- I totally relate to the shop owners of the world and what the, they're going through in, in their uh, normal day-to-day lives. My dad was a uh, landscaping business owner. He ran a landscaping company during the day and unfortunately wasn't ever able to get it to a point where that was enough. So he had to drive a truck at night. Yeah. So he worked two jobs pretty much my entire life, and uh, I got my work ethic from from him. Uh, Today, I'm I'm blessed to be married to a beautiful wife uh, named Michelle, and I have two amazing kids, Stephen and Caitlin, who are six and four years old. I really love spending time with them. We just finished up coaching Little League. Unfortunately, we lost last night in the playoffs. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It sounds like the Eagles. Sorry. Oh, man. Come on. <laughs> hey, you're talking to a Bills fan here. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So, yeah, I feel your pain. Still living in the 90s, huh? <laughs> no, not anymore. I know. You guys are on the on the, on the the rise. Sure. So, yeah. So, I I, I went to uh, college in Pennsylvania. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, fell into a sales job halfway through college and ended up working for a big company called Heartland Payments uh, in 2008 when I graduated college and uh, met my business partner Lisa there and also Jesse Mada. And uh, after a few years there, we, we were doing well, but we had a really terrible boss. I don't know if anybody can relate. Uh, this boss was just the worst. And one day Lisa called me pretty upset about some things that he had said to her and we both kind of just said, you know, why not? Let's just do this on our own. We were 24 and 26 years old, uh, didn't know anything about business. We knew how to sell. We knew how to sell credit card processing specifically. Right. Uh, but we were young and dumb and had nothing to lose. So we that's how we started 360 Payments in Lisa's spare bedroom. Sounds like a lot like a shop owner. You know, young, dumb, and goes out and decides to start start a shop. Hey, how hard could it be? Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> how, exactly. How hard could it be? So, so it sounds like you got some parallels to the automotive shop. You know, I think I think a lot of entrepreneurs can probably relate. Shop owners, uh, you know, myself. Sometimes you just get mad and upset working for the man, and uh, you think you can do it better, especially when you're younger. Everything you think you can do everything better, <laughs> and I think you quickly learn there's there's reasons why uh, you know things are the way they are, and certainly learned a lot of lessons along the way, which I'm hopefully I can share some of them today. Well, we're definitely looking forward to hearing some of those lessons. So, how did you end up? servicing the aftermarket auto repair business? 
Well, so when 360 started, as I mentioned, we were we were really a sales company. We were reselling some products and uh, we were knocking on doors. That's that's what we're great at, actually. Lisa, myself, Jesse, we we've we used to say uh, tight to the right. So you go start at a, on a block and you go around the corner until you came back to the same spot you started and you hit every single business, every door, every floor. And uh, so we were selling credit card processing payments to, uh, you know, retail shops, restaurants, golf courses. And we always found that when we did come across auto repair, uh, repair shop owners were just the most humble, uh, the most willing to, to talk to us. We just, I don't know, there was something about that industry of, of people that, you know, are working with their hands and, and running a business, you know, usually a husband and wife team. Uh, I think we just all personally related to them. So we started gaining a little bit of traction uh, a few years into our business. We had done pretty well in the Bay Area. We had about two or 3,000 customers at the time, uh, and, and a lot of banks were referring us. Uh, but but it, it really started in 2016 when credit cards went from uh, mag stripe to chip. And at that point, we recognized there was an opportunity to go into a, uh, an industry where technology was a bit lagging. We felt that the automotive industry, as, as we had, you know, from an outsider's perspective, took a look at it, could use a bit of an upgrade. And we thought, you know, we're not Steve Jobs, we're not invent, reinventing the wheel. If we could do some, some basic blocking and tackling, uh, we could really make a, a dent on that, on that industry. And, you know, one of my favorite books is a book called Good to Great. Mm -hmm. And Jim Collins talks about, you know the hedgehog concept, and I think that's one of the things that's made us the most successful, um, or, or one of the reasons why we've had success is, you know, focusing in on being the best at one thing, mm -hmm. and, and not being a generalist, uh, and that 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 made all the difference. At, at that point in time, we started building technology for the automotive repair industry. We started focusing on integrations with shop management systems, and uh, that's that's led to where we are today. What were the things that <clears throat> led you to uh, uh, to different things within the automotive industry what you know what what did you find or how did you talk to shop owners about what was needed was it a case-by-case -case basis did you find some big brainstorm of all well, this is what the whole industry needs how did you how did you get to where you are that's a great question thank you um, you know one of the things I noticed uh, when we were trying to figure out what we wanted to be when we grew up. You know, I remember we started going to industry shows and I remember one of the first shows we went to was uh, Mudlick Mail's Mudstock event many years ago. Greg Sands was running that that show and, and uh, at, at that moment we got to sit through a lot of the training sessions that were being given to the attendees. And through that experience that sitting next to the repair shop owners we felt that we could identify a few areas that hadn't really been built out from a payments viewpoint or a technology viewpoint. And that helped us kind of glean, you know, what we could do to, to build out a, a solution that would really help the shop owner putting them first and thinking about how we could inc improve their experience and their customer's experience. But we had also gone to a lot of other trade shows in other industries. And when I looked at, for example, the winery industry, I live in the Bay Area, so you know, wineries are right in my backyard. I used to go to a lot of those tra trade shows. I noticed that the type of integrations that were already in place in that space were completely missing in the repair space. If you think about your experience in most repair shops, if you walk into a, a Joe's Auto, Joe's at the front counter, he's got a shop management system, which is maybe a, li a little bit outdated. It's not in the cloud. And his credit card machine is sitting on the side. Mm -hmm. And so he prints out his invoice, his repair order, hands it to the customer, and he prints out another another repair order for signature. He walks over to the credit card machine. He hand keys in the transaction amount, prints out a receipt, staples it. Just a lot of paper, a lot of reconciliation that had to happen. And we felt, wow, we could just quickly and, and easily build something that would eliminate all of that back and forth that most shop owners were still doing from our experience of walking into the door and cold calling them. Well, see, and I, I got to tell you this as a shop owner, former shop owner, I you just described my credit card processing to a T. Outdated the shop management system, keyed it in, that whole thing. And, and uh, you probably don't know this, but shop owner coach, we're also one of your customers. 
And so all of my coaching clients get you use this seamless transa- transaction process that you guys have. It's it's a great process. It's and I, I'm a huge advocate for 360 payments because I see what oh, it thank does. you. I see what it does in the shop. I've, I, I I recommend it to all my all my clients. Uh, it, it it takes a lot of hassle out of the process, and I'm glad that you guys recognize it because it's one of the things that sets you guys apart. Well, Steve, you know technology in the automobile itself has changed dramatically increase you know continues to change dramatically what has it been holding the automotive repair shop back from the technology you know what 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 is it that makes us think eh, we're still old school uh that's that's a great question i think there's been a lack of investment by a lot of technology companies in this space because there hasn't been shop owners out there that are that are asking for it i think the processes work you know the the companies out there today that are servicing you know the big the big guys out there that are servicing many many shop owners they figured out the process that does work fairly well it's just that there wasn't additional uh entries into the market to press them along to make the advancement that was necessary and i think when people who are not part of this industry think about automotive they they immediately go to the franchise dealer world and think that's where the money's at the dealerships have a lot of capital to spend and so they would they would build technology in that space but actually another big reason why i think we're seeing a change in in in, in technology in, in the aftermarket is that the cost of building technology has come down dr- dramatically the old days you know you were you were building technology products that would cost a business tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And now you can buy a shop management system for what, $200 a month on average. And and that's really reasonable, I think. So you're seeing the, the advancement of technology because there's more entry, entries into the market and the cost of building technologies come down. And we're, you know, as a, as a humanity, we're increasing our pace of technology building dramatically. And let's be honest, I think, Vic, even even you as a, as a former shop owner would agree that you probably looked at your job as fixing cars. Mm-hmm. What you did was mechanical. Right. You replaced brakes. You changed tires. You tuned up and you did things that, you know, anything that would help you do your job was was a nice to have right but your job was fixing cars yeah and that was that's what we did it's not what a shop owner and shop you know a technician identifies mm-hmm. with is we fix cars yeah you but if the, you, you ask anybody to yeah ask shop owner say what do you do we fix cars yeah you, it's customer service yeah exactly so it, it it's it's customer service that's the uh, that's the goal and so making that making that switch probably is is a big step for a lot of people i think and and correct me if i'm wrong steve i believe a lot of it's generational because i think you see the older shops let me rephrase that the older shop owners Mm -hmm. who's who's not an early adopter he's comfortable with this process but you're probably seeing the more you know a lot of your newer customers younger shop owners younger shop owners are probably demanding this right out of the gate they don't they probably don't want the the stuff to keep it am i am i right well, I'd hate to classify by demographics necessarily. I think there are a lot of older shop owners who are willing to get out of their comfort zone. But mm-hmm. to your point is well taken in the sense that if you've been doing something for 20 years and it's been working, and there's many shop owners who've had great successful businesses over mm-hmm. many, many years and haven't had to change too much. What we're seeing today, though, is that because the pace of technology is increasing, the competition is also becoming more challenging and you're seeing consolidation in the aftermarket how many how many times do you hear about repair shops being purchased by large conglomerates so there's an entry into the market with with more capital uh faster paced technology and uh, you know think about evs electric electric vehicles that's going to change everything in in this industry and you know shop owners need to be thinking forward about how do i stay ahead of the curve and ahead of the competition because it's it's going to get more fierce over time mm-hmm. and speaking of change and being <laughs> uh, being accepting of change 
obviously the last year made us realize that things can change in a second and you need to be uh, you know you need to be adaptable um, how did you see the past year for your business and business uh, you know the automotive business in general well we certainly uh, in in the beginning of the pandem- pandemic our revenue as a company is tied to credit card processing. So when processing volumes drop, we make less revenue. And in the first month, our revenue dropped nearly 50%. So it was a, it was a stressful time. Now, fortunately, <laughs> we chose the right industry to be a part of and, and to focus on. Had we been in the restaurant business, you know, things may have been a little bit different. I think we should all be thankful and grateful to be in the aftermarket business because thank God we were we were still considered uh, necessary companies. Sure. Uh, you know, things changed dramatically. You know, of course, repair shops, uh, the way they communicated to their customers really changed. I think there was a lot of adoption by shop owners to use uh, technology like digital vehicle inspection uh, and texting tools. And certainly text to pay was a big hit. We were fortunate to be in the right place at the right time for that. Uh, and I think in general, you know, people are more virtual. I, I run eight to 10 meetings a day now and every one of them pretty much are virtual. Shop owners are more comfortable getting on a, on a virtual conversation uh, and, and things don't have to be in, in person. Mm-hmm. And where in, where people work and live is also changing. I think that's gonna continue to, uh, you know, affect you know, even uh, most shop most shop owners might not think about this, but your your demographic and where you live is is probably going to change. If you're in a highly dense city like San Francisco, they're seeing massive amounts of people leaving the city and going to less expensive areas. And so, the demographics of of where people work, when they work, I think are going to continue to change over time. And yet, with all of these immediate changes, I guess you don't have every shop owner on your uh, working with you at this point. There are still uh, potential shops out there to shops uh, to to make there's it's change. amazing. There's 170,000 according to the data we have, 170,000 individual or or rooftops out there mm-hmm. uh, aftermarket repair businesses. And uh, we you know, we certainly have a lot a lot of runway for our our company to grow. So how does a shop owner relate to 360 payments and you know how are you, are you guys similar well at the end of the day we're both running a company with teams and we're both building tech or using technology to try to stay ahead of the competition and i you know i really think about you know our business in three categories uh people process and technology you've probably heard of that before mm-hmm. uh at 360, we're highly focused on our people and culture, building out a, a strong culture has always been uh, one of our top priorities as a company. And we do that through a variety of ways. And I think, you know, shop owners could could think about how they could spend more time on their culture because if you have a great team, you can be certain that your customers are gonna be taken care of and your customers are gonna have a great experience because your team cares as much a- about the company as you do. And we've we've definitely been able to achieve that through a variety of different measures. Things like uh, setting up a mission, a mission or a vision, uh, setting up company values. Uh, those are all things that we've done in the past, or, or st- still currently do. Yeah, so, so, so mission values and culture. Those those are very similar to what an auto repair shop will do. So, your culture, you've defined it, and you're, you, it sounds like you're drawing some good talent that, towards 360. Uh, and, and you find any difficulty finding talent? Well, talent is, uh, we're in an interesting time right now, economically, mm-hmm. where it's definitely apparent that there is a shortage of talent out there right now. And I, I'm, I'm sure shop owners are feeling that. I know they were feeling that even before because there's just a lack of technicians in the market. Right. Uh, so I, I know that's never easy. So having a great culture does help you stand apart from the competition. You know, at 360, we've got a mission to uh, to, to make payments easy and make payments an afterthought. Mm-hmm. And also, as most shop owners may understand, credit card processing has a pretty 
unfortunate, uh, opaque type of uh, reputation. <laughs> There's been a lot of companies out there because it's an unre unregulated financial industry. Uh, we've always st we've taken the standpoint of we're going to be the good guys in a bad industry. We're going to clean up this industry, and that that really appeals to people when they come in to interview with us. That we're the good guys and we're going to go and you know you know fight the bad guys. I guess you could say so. Having that purpose is is a big key. You know, a shop owner could have a purpose to you know make the community safer by providing you know clean and and safe cars on the road. You know, it's something like the higher purpose than just, hey, we're here to fix cars. The white hat, black hat kind of thing, good guys, bad guys. What what do you see um, are the are the bad tendencies that people are concerned about? Uh, in the credit card business? Yeah. Particularly there, because you're right, I think credit cards are sort of misunderstood people know that they've got to pay the bills on them they know that they're you know if it's a debit card it comes out of their account but in the meantime it's sort of a an unknown an unknown industry to a lot of us well, and that's very similar to auto repair how many of us that's actually true. know how to fix a car and so at the end of the day, it really comes down to trust and reputation and you know reputation takes years to build and can can be crumbled in seconds. And so building that reputation as a repair shop owner is absolutely essential and critical. And things like technology that helps you get more reviews on your website, more Google or Yelp reviews are, are things that you should be focused on and making sure to, to build. We, we put a lot of emphasis in getting good reviews at 360. Uh, but to answer your question, Doug, uh, you know, in the payments business, there's not a lot of people out there that really understand the the inner workings of how it, how it all comes together. And there's actually many parties involved. You've got Visa, MasterCard, Discover, Amex. You've got the processors. You've got gateway technology companies. And everybody's got a little piece of the pie when it comes to collecting fees. And what we did is we said, look, we're just going to be full disclosure and tell you all the fees. We're not going to put people in the long-term contracts. A lot of times you'll see companies come in and promise a rate and then you're stuck in a three-year contract or even worse, a lease, you know, never lease equipment. Leasing is, is just terrible because the, the hardware is not expensive. You shouldn't have to finance it. Yeah, and he, he, he speaks, you know, I'm going to back up. Steve, Steve speaks very, very true. Leasing equipment is very expensive. I didn't catch it until later in my term with, with mine. I was paying, I think it was 25 bucks a month. Well, what's that over the course of a year? Right. And you know what's a terminal run? You know two ninety nine. I, I was spending you know four hundred dollars in, in a give in a year. Yeah. So it, that made no sense. It can be a low cost to entry, but a high cost to to exit. Yeah. And I, what I love is the transparency. <laughs> and it, when I first talked with Jesse about mine, it was like he was he he did he went down all all the the fees. Whereas if you talk to another processing company, it's like a lot of times they don't know really know what it is. They give you a bottom line number of the what percentage and it comes out being being more and you're already into it and you're like you said you're stuck with with a long-term program uh you know we're, we're 360 they, they take the they take the pain away from from the shop owner standpoint of if you don't like and I, i'll say it like this if you don't like it move on to somebody else because you don't you're not stuck you know it, what's the worst thing that can happen it's like with with what with my coaching business i, I don't have contracts and you know that's highly, highly beneficial. It, it takes it does so it, it takes the, the risk away. Would you agree with that, Steve? That's the reason why you guys do it. Absolutely, I want people to want to do business with us. I don't want them to feel like they're stuck. So right. our our goal is to provide enough value, and when we we understand that we have to continue to provide value. You know, we measure. Uh, and this is something maybe a, a tip for a shop owner, but we we ask every single customer and this is automated through some of the technology that we use internally but we ask every single customer that that interacts with our team you know how did you like our service and we call that a, a customer satisfaction score mm -hmm. and we measure that every single month every quarter and, and track it over time to make sure uh, actually weekly honestly we look at it weekly and if we see a dip we're looking into those those scenarios like hey what happened here we're not perfect of course 
Uh, so, you know, just doing your best to make sure that customers are satisfied and actually looking at data that says it is true or not true. So when a shop owner has to think about credit card processing, the, the what's behind it and all of that stuff, what should they be, you know, what should be, what should they be thinking about? I'm, I'm sure all they really want to think about is, are they going to get their money? Uh, you know, for the payment that the customer's making, you know, where, how is, how secure is that? Are those things that the, uh, the shop owners are concerned about? I think they are to some degree. I think they, they expect security. Security is table stakes to be a part of the payments industry. You can't, you can't offer a, a solution that is going to get a, a shop owner in trouble from a, a you know, credit card data standpoint. Uh, you know, a lot of shop owners want to save money and they've almost been conditioned because of the industry that every single credit card guy that ever calls you says without even looking at your statement I'm gonna save you money and the truth is mm -hmm. the dirty little secret is that every credit card processor has the same wholesale rates imagine if you could buy parts at the same wholesale cost as you know one of the large 500 location suppliers out there that's that's essentially what is true in, in payments. Uh, so we, we all have the same wholesale. The only thing that's negotiable is our markup. And a lot of shop owners or uh, processors know that and they know they can just come in and undercut you or your comp, whoever your current provider is to save you money. But that, that savings is only temporary oftentimes. You know, so I would, I would implore shop owners to look for more value from their payments provider. How, how are they integrated to your system? How are they saving you soft costs like time? How are they helping you go digital with your paper? You know, are you still printing out receipts and getting signed receipts and then saving those receipts for seven years? Mm -hmm. Or are you, storing, are you storing your receipts digitally? You know, are you, are you offering some way of communicating with your customers for payment either on your website uh, or text message? Uh, are, are you offering consumer financing? One of the things that uh, we're building out right now is a consumer financing platform where the customer at the point of decision, which is critical, because if you offer me financing for a repair job after you already did the job, it's too late. Mm -hmm. I decided not to move forward the entire job. But if you offer financing at the point of decision where they're saying, hmm, should I just do the altern alternator or should I do the whole, the rest, everything else that's on the list? Well, if I have a, a simple payment method with no interest for six months, I might decide to do the whole job and increase the ARO. That, that's, a, that's a huge tool. No interest financing inside a business. It, it's, a, it's a great way. And like he said, it, it, it's got to be at the point of decision. Right. Not, not at the point, you know, you're completing the sale because you will sell, you will sell more. How does the financing... Uh, how does the financing part work? Uh, you know, we've seen we've seen some of those um, some of those credit cards out there that are designed for low uh, low income, high interest kind of credit cards. Um, you know, when when does that become a decision that the uh, um, the shop owner's comfortable making as to offer that service? Yeah, there's definitely companies out there that have pretty high interest to the consumer. The merchant, uh, the shop owner, typically pays anywhere from you know two to three percent, just kind of like a credit card. Uh, the, the consumer, in scenarios where they are paying very high interest, it's, it's because they've got lower credit scores. And you could look at it one of two ways. One, you could say this is a bit. It, it's it's a high interest rate and maybe we shouldn't offer it but you could also look at it like they don't have another option mm -hmm. and they need the funds today to pay for their car to get back on the road to go to work so it's it's a, a delicate balance I think the key is that you explain it to the consumer whoever's buying you know the, the financing and make sure they understand and that's that's what part of the technology does is, is being very transparent about you know the rates that are being offered and making sure the customer knows what they're getting themselves into so on the 360 payments, that's not designed as a last chance financing. That, that's more your your payment pro process or your your financing component is more designed for 
the you know at the at the point of decision, not as a last chance. It's both. We're we're going to have it implemented depending on which shop software is being used or digital vehicle inspection software. Uh, it, it could show up in a variety of ways, and we're honestly we're still really early in this. We're just starting to launch it now with a few integrations. Right. So you'll see more about this coming up for us in uh, in future months. But uh, it ideally, you know, the recommended pathway is to put it at the point of decision. Okay. So this episode is brought to you by I360 Payments, the automotive industry's leading credit card processor. 360 Payments make payments simple, secure, and streamlined for auto shops through seamless integration with dozens of shop management software and DVI tools. 360 Payments offers solutions for in-person and remote payments, including text-to-pay, which lets your customer pay from their smartphone when it's convenient for them. Visit 360payments.com slash podcast to learn more. So let's talk about how all of those different uh, elements, the management software and the DVI tools, all are integrated with payment. Um, with, with multiple different platforms, it seems like a complex, uh, complex series of, uh, of uh, operations to make it happen. Is it challenging for the shop owner to incorporate the, the payments? No, if they're using a shop management software tool or a digital vehicle inspection tool, it's just going to appear on their interface as an extra button to say, "Hey, would you like to, you know, uh, would you like to?" Or it'll say, "You know, pay with the terminal or send a text to pay." And every every system does implement the technology a little differently, so it'll it'll vary ba- based on which company you're working with, but it's pretty simple and straightforward. So with with your background, with your startup, you know, with the fact that you're a young entrepreneur, what are some of the things that you could talk to our young entrepreneurs out there, some younger shop owners who are listening to you today that you could say, okay, these are some of the attributes that you will need that I use inside of my company to build 360 payments. What could you share with them? Uh, yeah, I love, I love that question. Thank you. Um, you know, I think early on what you lack in skill you make up in effort and when we started 360 i i knew how to do one thing i knew how to sell Mm -hmm. and i knew how to work hard and that that was the key to it we we were obsessed with our business every day putting in crazy hours now there's a lot of studies out there that say you probably don't you know and as i get and as i get older I'm, i'm recognizing this you can't work 14 hour days every day of your life and expect to be happy. So sleep is important. Uh, but you know, truly when we were, when we were early on, we just grinded really hard Mm -hmm. and, and just believed in ourselves. We knew we would find a way and kept our eyes open for opportunity. Uh, we tried a lot of different things. We actually had many different ideas fail. So don't be afraid of failure. We had, um, we had all types of, we had text messaging. We had our own point of sale at one point. We were selling to restaurants so that failed. So there was a lot of failure along the way and uh, you just kind of keep going and get back on the horse. Um, I would say the other thing is that I've read a lot of, a lot of uh, business books and that has helped shape the company to what it is today. You know, books about culture, books about recruiting, books about managing and leading. Those are all uh, things that I think really helped us uh, you know, put an emphasis and focus on our team and our people, and build a build a strong team. The reason why 360 is successful is truly because we have a great team. Our our people are the best in the business. Let's talk about your team. How many are you know? How many are part of your team? Are you all located in in one office? How is what's your structure like? Yeah, great question. So we started off in Silicon Valley. And we were largely doing everything. So I would sell the sell the deal, do the paperwork, install the account. And as time grew, we, we hired people in Silicon Valley to do all these different job functions. And uh, <laughs> we found out quickly that having an, uh, a call center in the heart of Silicon Valley, the most expensive place in the world to live, is probably not a really smart idea. Mm-hmm. 
So we were fortunate to uh, get hooked up with an, a fellow entrepreneur and a great business leader, a guy named Phil, who helped us get into uh, partner with him to go to Tulsa. So now today we've got we're still a small team doing a lot of different things. Um, we, we have 36 employees and we've got uh, more than half of them now, about 22 of them, I think, in uh, in Tulsa. And the rest are still in, in California, throughout the Bay Area. A lot of the executive team and, and, and technology team is in California. But our call center is in Tulsa. Got it. What kind of calls are your, are you, you know, what, what, what comes into the call center? I think automotive people know what a helpline would be for when it comes to getting, <laughs> getting support for uh, repairing a car. But what kind of uh, calls are you guys getting? Uh, anything from a, a lot of technical, actually. We, we do measure how much of it's technical versus uh, account-related, maintenance-based. And about 70% of our calls are technical in nature. Uh, so my credit card machine is offline, or I need to change the date and time on the machine, or, hey, my syncing with Shop Boss isn't working. How do I fix that? And our team's gotten really good at uh, – we've created videos for each – uh, product and integration that we work with so we can help a shop owner you know quickly just send them a video and say here's how it works and usually gets uh, gets it up you know fixed pretty quickly when it comes to technology let's talk about the change from credit card machines to text to pay you know how's the how's that process evolved where is it going you know, where is it now where is it going what's the reaction been to uh, text to pay from a, a uh, your customer's standpoint and your customer's customer's standpoint? I, I think it's growing in nature. Uh, you know, we, when during the pandemic, we saw about 15, or excuse me, uh, 30% of all transactions going through text to pay. It's actually come back down a little bit now. So we're seeing more people are actually in shop. But the convenience factor Cap to the customer is, is often worth it and the, the opportunity to uh, to increase the, the repair order and those kinds of things? It, well, certainly increasing repair order kind of falls into the DVI realm. And when you pair text-to-pay with DVI, it's really powerful because the customer is getting that, you know, that beautiful uh, image on their phone. They can make the decision at home. They can do the research. They can look at, you know, the pictures and all those things that help sell a job. And then when there's a payment at the end of the at the end of the line, it, it does increase the experience or improve the experience for the, the customer. So, so Steve, I'm a big believer in book reading. I understand that throughout the years, what I I haven't learned, and I found that a lot of or I found with all my close coaching customers, I encourage them to be readers. So, my question for you is, what's your favorite book, and what are you reading around this this point in your life? I agree. Leaders are readers. And uh, actually, I just finished a couple books. Uh, I finished a book called Drive, uh, which talks about intrinsic motivation and how to help motivate your team and people. And uh, a really great book I highly recommend is a, a book called Measure What Matters. Okay. And that is uh, really centered around a concept of objectives and key results. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of running your business. So, um, a lot of technology companies, including Google, uh, Facebook, other companies of that stat stature have implemented objectives and key results. And essentially what you do is you set a quarterly or annual uh, objective saying, hey, I want to, it, and it could be any objective. It could be, we want to hire uh, a great technician. That's the objective. And then how do you get to that objective? How do you, what are the steps to getting, or what are the measurable results to say that, yes, we achieved that objective? And it could be, you know, interview 10 candidates in the month of May. Uh, it could be, you know, make two offers. Mm -hmm. And so you're tracking the actual uh, key results that are occurring from that. And that's, that's been extremely impactful at 360. We've been running our business on OKRs for a long time. We use a tool called 15.5 okay. uh, that, puts a weekly check-in with your employees and lets them tell you how they're feeling, helps you run your uh, your one-on-ones with them. So, uh, great book there. Mm -hmm. uh, my most recent favorite book, I just read this book called Sapiens, and it talks about the history of humanity and 
where we're heading. I'm, I'm totally into the future, the, you know, what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years. A mm-hmm. uh, book called The Future is Faster Than You Think is another good one I just read recently. Uh, and essentially it talks about, you know, we're all going to be connected to the internet and you can live forever and there's going to be a lot of crazy things that happen <laughs> in, in the upcoming quarter century. So that's, that's what I'm into right now. I don't, I don't know if anybody wanted me around the rest of, for, for, off from my, their entire life. Yeah. yeah. Steve, your philosophy is uh, not tech center, tech company specific. It, it feels like it could be used across any business um, to be a to be an effective manager. Do you serve as a consultant? Like Vic serves as a coach to uh, to shop owners. Do you serve as a consultant to shop owners in this regard? Uh, if they call me and ask, I'm happy to share any insight uh, that I can. But I, I definitely don't have much time on my hands to actually be a consultant these days. But hopefully someday I'd like to give back and and um, you know be able to be a, a consultant to others because. I highly recommend it. Early on, we were fortunate to have a few consultants that helped us. And if you're not, if you're, if you don't have a coach pushing you or, or giving you some advice, yeah, it's something you probably should go out and do right away. Highly recommend getting a coach because it, it makes all the difference in the world. And not to say necessarily that Vic is the one you should call, but Vic, as a coach, can you give us some of the feet, some of the uh, the high points from what we learned today, some of those tips. Well, you know, one of the biggest things is, you know, I, 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 I kind of hit it near the end was read books. I took a, one of the things away was learn from your failures. I think a lot of times folks will, will step away from their failures when they, they fail and not try again. But John Maxwell has a really killer book called Failing Forward. You know, if, if you're going to fa- fail, fall on your face forward, you're at least six feet ahead. And don't, look at, don't look at it as a, as a tough lesson. Uh, build a great team, you know, build your culture, and it, this is a, the, everything we've talked about today is a universal component that could be a, applied to any element of any business, no matter whether it's payments or whether it's automotive or publishing. Got it. Got it. Yeah, our guest today has been Steve Sibitoni from 360 Payments, the automotive industry's leading credit card processor. 360 Payments makes payments simple, secure, and streamlined for auto shops through seamless integration with dozens of shop management software and DVI tools. 360 Payments offers solutions for in-person and remote payments, including text-to-pay, which lets your customer pay from their smartphone when it's convenient for them. Visit 360payments.com slash podcast to learn more. Steve, thanks so much for joining us and reminding us that what we think our businesses are may not really be what we really are doing. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Vic. It was a great time. I enjoyed it. Have a great day. If you've got questions, comments, suggestions for us, you can reach me at dkoffman at babcox.com. You can reach Vic at vic at shopownercoach.com. Till we get together again soon, thanks very much. Have a great day.